Today's chapter we're going to be learning is Bava Batra Daf Yud Zion, and with that we will finish the first chapter of Bava Batra. Today's Daf is sponsored by Batsheva and Daniel Pava in loving memory of her father, Reb Shlomo ben Yehuda Aryeveg, Zechronol of Rachan, his first year at site. My father was a child survivor of Auschwitz, he became a Talmud of Reb Michal Bar West, West, West Mandel. My dad is a hero. I miss him every single day. Okay, we're going to get started now with um, Tanu Rabbanan at the bottom of Tetzayin and Mubet. So we're going to finish up these stories. We're done already with Eov. Let's just remind ourselves how we got here. We were talking about the whole chapter was really about dividing of joint property or joint courtyards. With then we got to, but you can't divide Kitve Kodesh because they have a different level of sanctity. And from that, we got into Kitve Kodesh and we got into scrolls and how they're written, what the rules are, and then we got into who wrote different books of Tanakh, and from there we got into that Moshe wrote Eov, and then we said, well, when did Eov live? And we had all these discussions, and we ended up with this long digression about Eov. It actually reminded me of, remember the chapters uh, in the, in uh, Masechet Megillah, you might remember there's a whole chunk of Dapim, actually much longer than these, about all these drashot on Megillah Esther, and it's kind of interesting because it was kind of like that, where we just take Pasuk after Pasuk and Eov and Darshan them, okay, where it's kind of atypical for the Gemara to be doing that. The real question is, why is this here? Why do we have a whole digression about Eov, specifically in the first chapter of Bava Batra? I'm going to leave it to you to think about over Shabbat. I haven't come up with an answer yet. I'm not sure if I will, but I'm going to try to think about it and think about what the connection of Eov and, you know, I thought about a little bit of his friends because a lot of this is all about your neighbors and your relationships with others. But there wasn't so much of a focus on that, in, although there was a bit of it in these psukim, in these drashot. Anyway, it's something to think about why Eov, specifically if you're going to want to talk about why did it end up here. Obviously, you can always say, well, technically we were talking about Tidfei Kodesh, but usually I think there's more of a reason as to why that is. Now, because we got into Eov and we were talking about... Um, um, we were talking about that, sorry, just, all right, about the daughters and the daughters of Eov and why at the end of the book does he not get double the reward about the daughters? So just like Eov, um, we said about his daughters and that maybe there's this machloket about whether it's good to have daughters, not good to have daughters. When from there we got into Avraham and how there's the same debate by Avraham. And now we're, we're going to basically finish the chapter off with some things that were unique about Avraham, specifically based on this pasuk of Hashem Berach and Avraham Bakol, that we had seven different interpretations of what this is. Three of them related to the having a girl and whether it's a blessing or not a blessing. From there, we're going to get into all sorts of other drashot, not only about Avraham, but we're going to see that his sons, Yitzchak and Yaakov, were also blessed with a very similar type of blessing. And what does this mean about the three of them? And we're going to have a whole bunch of different opinions about what that blessing includes. So, Tanu Rabbanam, very bottom of yesterday's stuff. By the way, it's okay, let's just read it and then I'll, I'll tell you the by the way. There were three people in this world who God gave them a taste of what the world to come is going to be like, meaning they had a very good life. God blessed them with many great things. Who were these people? Elohim, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. Notice who's missing here? Eov. We already said it just before that Eov also ended up with Me'en Olam Haba, but this drasha doesn't seem to allude to that at all. And why the three of them? Abraham, Dichtiv Be Bakol. That's we saw Hashem Berachad Abraham Bakol. Yitzchak dichtiv be mikol. Okay, this is in the pasuk we saw the other day. But by Yecharad Yitzchak charadat dola when he realizes that that Yaakov has taken Esau's bracha, and then it says, "Mi efohu atzad sayid vayaveli vaochal mikol." I will eat from everything, meaning he also got everything. And Yaakov dichtiv be kol. By Yaakov it says kol, which is kach ne berchati. When Yaakov goes to Esau, he says, "Take my blessing, Asher yaveti lach." God has been good to me and I have everything. This is right, what you always want. We always say you can't have everything. They had everything. You might recognize already that when we say in the benching, right, we want to be blessed like that's this. Okay, that's exactly from these three words and from this Gemara that puts those three words together. 
other things about these brachot. We're now going to have different versions of what does it mean, we have right now, they had, they lived in this world. The evil inclination didn't control them. Okay, so again, it's a different bracha from they had everything meaning the evil inclination didn't rule over them. Some people add David to this list, which is interesting because he's sitting with Bathsheba. What was that if not Yetzir Hara? Okay, some people say that this is according to the opinion. Remember, there's Gemara that says anyone who says David sinned, sinned Eno Ela Toez, mistaken. He really didn't sin with Bathsheba, and then they have to explain it some other way. Anyway, perhaps this goes like that. Okay, which is almost like my heart was destroyed within me, which means my evil inclination. Idach, now the ones who say that David did sin, had it, or they don't have David on the list of, they just have, remember, we had Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Some people say David. So how do they explain that pasuk? When he said, my heart sunk in, inside me, meant I was very sad from all the tragedies that I went through in my lifetime. Okay, I went through a lot, and that means something totally different. Tanu Rabbanan, another bright tab about these topics. Shishalo shalapehem malach There's six people who malach didn't get to. Okay, we've been talking about malach and the Satan. So there's three people, the angel, six people, the angel of death never got to, which means they died directly from God. The angel of death isn't the one who brought their death. Eluhen. Avraham Yitzchak V'yakov, for the obvious reasons of that's what it means they had everything. Moshe Aharon Umiriam. Okay, we'll have to explain why then. Abraham Yitzchak V'yakov, Dichtibu Bako Mikoko, as you can expect. Moshe Aharon Miriam Dichtibu Al Pi Hashem. Okay, by Moshe Aharon and Miriam, although not exactly, but it says by them they died Al Pi Hashem. It says it explicitly in the Pasuk. So let's see. From um, uh, Aharon, it says, Vayal Aharon HaKohen, at the end of Sefer Bamidbar, El Hor HaHar Al Pi Hashem Vayam Hashem. Okay, so he goes up to the Har Hashem, by, by God's word, and dies there. Moshe, which were in the Pesukim we just read, Vayamat Sham Moshe Eved Hashem Be'eretz Moav Al Pi Hashem. Okay, Moshe died there by the word of God. Okay, what they understand by the word of God is to be like with the kiss of God, that God basically kissed them, and with that they, they died. Vaham Miriam Lo Ketiv Al Pi Hashem, but how did she get to this list? It doesn't say Al Pi Hashem when it says she died. She also died with the kiss of God. Right? The, the way they understand, I explain how Piyashem is by the word of God. That's the way you would literally understand the Pesach. They understand by the mouth of God, meaning that God kissed them and that was how they died. Well, because it says that Miriam, that she died there, it said in the Pesach about her death. And by Moshe, it says he died there. So it must be she died in the same manner. Well, the obvious question. So why didn't it say al pi Hashem? Well, she g'nai ha-davar lomal. It's, it's not respectful to talk about God kissing a woman in, in de- you know, to kill, uh, as her death. Not, not because as her death, just the idea of God kissing a woman didn't sound appropriate, so they didn't want to say al pi Hashem to, about a woman, so they did it in a different kind of way, which is make a reference to Moshe and say she died in the same way. Tanu Rabbanan. There are seven people who, okay, we keep getting different numbers here. There's, right, we started with things that are only Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Then we gave, came up with other things that there's other people, and we have other psukim to prove it, not bakol, mikol, or kol, but some other word. So here also we have seven now, that their, their bodies didn't get full of worms and, and rot, basically, the body after death. Who are these people? Elohim, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam, Ubinyamim ben Yaakov. So, Avrav Yitzchak Yaakov dechtivu b'akol mikol kol. Moshe Aharon u'Miriam dechtivu al pi Hashem. Or if you're going to die al pi Hashem, then you're going to die a different kind of death. Your body's not going to end up full of worms and decompose that way. Binyamin ben Yaakov dechtivu le'binyamin amal yidid Hashem yishkon le'betach alav. Now, the real meaning of this pasuk, the way it's usually understood, is that God is going to dwell in the in the nachalav binyamin. Right, which means the Beit Hamikdash is in this section where right, the Kodesh Kodeshim particularly is in Binyamin's, um, in Binyamin's uh, their territory. But the way they understand it is Yedid Hashem Yishkon Labetach. God is always going to dwell with him, and therefore the Riman Tolea won't get to him. 
Yesh Omrim Af David. Some people say David because in Tehilim, which we already know was connected with David, whether he wrote it, Af Bisari Yishkon Lavetach. He also says, my flesh will, right, will always forever be in a good place, meaning, right, Rima V'toleah won't get to them. Well, Idach, the one who doesn't explain this pasuk in this way and doesn't add David to the list, what does he say? Hahu Rachamehu de Kabai. That was just a prayer that he didn't want his body to decompose and, and get full of worms. But it wasn't didn't mean that it happened. It was just his wishful thinking or, or asking God. Tanu Rabbanan. Last one. Arba'a metu be'et yoshal nachash. Okay. Four people died because of the nachash, which really means because of the sin of Adam Arishon. Now, what, right, the sin of Adam Arishon caused the fact that man will not be mortal, or humans won't be mortal, and... Basically, what they're saying is, were it not for that, these people never would have died. Because you know, if you assume you died because you sinned, so most people died because they sinned. These people never sinned, if you can imagine such a thing, and therefore they didn't deserve to die a regular death. But because of the sin of Adam Arisha, they died. Who are these people? This is going to be a bit of a more surprising kind of list. Eluhim bin Yamin bin Yaakov. Okay, we already had him on the list. That's not so surprising. Amram Avi Moshe. Amram, the father of Moshe. Yishai Avi David, Yishai the father of David. It's interesting. We always connect people with their fathers. Here we say this was the father of. We connect them with their sons, and the reason is obvious because they're, or at least partially obvious, right? Their sons were much more famous than they were. So Moshe, right, was obviously much more famous than his father Amram, and David was much more famous than his father Yishai. Now it could be that it's trying to tell you that what was so amazing about them, right? They were so amazing because look, they gave birth and and kind of brought up giving credit to the fathers of the great leaders of our, you know, of our history. And Kil'av bin David. And kind of random, one of the sons of David, whose name was Kil'av, he ended up on this list. Okay, how do we know about these four people, that they were such amazing people? We don't really. Kulu Gemara, it's all a tradition. We don't really have any reference in the verses to this Drasha that we're saying, that they died, you know, without any sin, and they really shouldn't have died otherwise, were it not for Adam Arishon. Levang mi Yishai avi David. Okay, except for Yishai, where we're going to find an interesting way they're going to learn this. Demefarish beikra, because the Pasuk had a reference to this. Dichtiv, ve'et amasa, sam avshalom, tachat yoav alatzava, we're having a changing, avshalom is making amasa, his new head of army, right, when avshalom rebels against David. Va'amasa, now who does he put? He, right, instead of Yav, he puts Amasa. Who is Amasa? We're going to learn this. could be a little bit complicated, but I'm going to say it very simply. Amasa was first cousins with Yoav, actually. So he's replacing his cousin. Amasa bin Ish, he was the son of a person. Okay, it's a little weird they say that. You could just could have said Ben Yitra. Okay, but instead of saying that, they say he's the son of a man. Ushmo, and his name is Yitra HaYisraeli. Asher Baal Avigayil. And his mother was Avigail. Okay, this man had relations with Avigail. Bat Nachash. She was the daughter of Nachash. And she was also Achot Sruya Em Yoav. What does this say? The mothers were sisters. Right? The mother of Yoav was the sister of the mother of Amasa. Okay, that's what they're telling you. Now, notice Avigail is called the daughter of Nachash. Now, the Chibat Nachashi, she wasn't the daughter of Nachash. There was no guy named Nachash. She was the daughter of Elabati Shaihi. She was the daughter of Yishai. Okay, this is interesting. I don't know if you, you realize this, but Dechtiv, Achyotehem, Tzruya, Vavigal. Yoab ben Tzruya, right, who we hear about a lot, and this Amasa, who's his cousin, both of their mothers, right, they were both cousins of David. Okay, their mothers were sisters of David. So now what do you see here? Right? How do we know this? Because it says, Achyotehem, when it was talking about David and his brothers, it said, and their sisters were Tzruya and Avigayim. El abat mi, so why was she called Bat Nachash if she's really the daughter of Yishai? Bat mi shemet be'el Nachash. She was the daughter of the one who died on account of the Nachash, on this, because of the snake. That's why he died. And with that, Hadra Nachash Utafin, we finish the first chapter of Baba Batra, which, as I said before, right, similar to Megillah, where we have all these drashot on on Esther, here we end up with all this drashot on on um, Eov. From there, we also get to Avraham, who's really his counterpart, as we talked about, right? There's a lot of comparisons between them. And we ended up with all these drashot about all these people that kind of shone above other people in all sorts of ways. 
Okay, again, Chomer Lamach Shabbat, we say food for thought for Shabbat to try to think about why the first chapter of Bava Batra, which again is all about, and, and we'll start with now what the first chapter was about, we're going to compare it to what the second chapter is about. First chapter is if we're living together, right, upon what basis, or we share items, can one demand from the other, right, that we divide it, okay, what size, how do we divide it, we talked about all that. Now we're going to talk about not living in shared property, but neighbors living next door to each other, and this is really the, the bulk of the chapter, if not the whole thing, I don't remember, but it's going to be about what am I allowed to do in my, or what am I not allowed to do in my area, my whether it's my house or my land, if I have fields, that in how do I have to be preventative to not cause damage in the next door field? To what extent? Okay, like nowadays, there's all sorts of rules of things you can't do close to the border of your neighbor's property. I know in Israel, right? And I'm sure it's the same in other places. You want to build a pool, for example. You can't build a pool within a certain measurement from your neighbor's property. You can't build a pergola uh, without you, there's all sorts of things that you can't do when you get closer to your neighbor's property. You have to be worried about potential damage, noise, right? It's unclear what all these things are all, what the reasons are. And that's what we're going to discuss now. Now, on the one hand, it's my property. I should be able to be, to do whatever I want. And in fact, we're going to see today a reference to a machloka we're going to come across later in the chapter about the rabbis and Rabbi Yossi. They both have a different approach to this whole thing. Rabbi Yossi has an approach, I can do whatever I want in my field. I really don't have to be worried about you. It's my property. I could do what I want. Okay, that's his approach to a certain extent, though. Even Rabbi Yossi is limited. If it's going to directly cause you damage, it's a different story. But if it's indirect, I don't have to worry about it. The rabbis say, no, you really have to worry. Okay, we're going to see today a case that they're going to quote in the name of the rabbis. We'll see later in the chapter that if I build, a, if I plant a tree, I have to, if you have a, a pit in your territory, I have to distance my tree 25 cubits. That's a lot of space from your bore so that my roots don't eventually get to your property and destroy them. Okay, that's where obviously Rabbi Yossi says, what do you mean? Like that is so indirect. I don't have to worry about that. Okay, but the rabbis think that I have to do that. I have to think about what are the ramifications, the long-term ramifications of what I'm doing on my property and how it might affect you. So in this Mishnah, we're not going to have a machloket, okay? We're going to just start with our Mishnah. Lo yachfor adam bo... Oh, and I just want to say one other thing, because I just want to say before we start, which is the mission doesn't deal with what if I did it anyway and it caused damage? Like what, in other words, if I did something that causes damage to my neighbor's property, then how do we assess the damage? You know, we... If you have neighbors, you probably know that sometimes it's very complicated. Okay, I'm gonna. I have a thing with one of my neighbors now that I have water in a in a wall that's that is a shared wall on my side. There's water damage, and on the other side, my neighbor has a pool, a, a fish pond, and the and basically the water sits there. And there's obviously, or at least again, obvious to us that there's it's not. Um, it's not, what do you say, a tomb, it's not sealed properly, and the water is leaking in and it's getting to our wall. Now, go prove it, right? It's very hard to prove. The, you know, I brought experts, he's brought experts, and you know, we're in a, an argument about what exactly is the source of the water damage. Is it coming from him? Is it coming from him? Right? Obviously, anyone I bring says, of course it's coming from there, and anyone he brings says, of course it's not. So it becomes very complicated, and perhaps that's why the mission is saying, let's try to prevent any of this from happening so that you don't end up in an argument, which could affect relationships, thank God, they're very nice people and it hasn't affected our relationship, but it's complicated, obviously. And, you know, trying to figure out who the damage is from and, and this isn't the first time we've had these kind of issues because it's not so clear cut. And then, you know, so better off it's possible that we're not even attacking it from the damages perspective. What we're saying is, let's try to avoid it. Let's try to keep your distance so that you don't do something that might eventually cause problems. So let's start with the Mishnah. Don't dig a bore, a pit for water, next to a bore of your neighbors. These are all things that have water. Because again, as I said, with the pool, right, the water gets through cracks and other things and could cause the wall of their 
bore to, to fall apart, and then their bore will be ruined. So you can't put not a shiach, which is another shiach and malah are different kinds of water ditches, and an amat mayim, which is a ch- water channel, or an ivrechet kovsim is a pool that they would use to soak the, the laundry. What you need to do is you need to distance yourself from the wall of your friend. Okay, already, ding, 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 there's some sort of problem here. We said, we started with, don't dig a bore next to your neighbor's bore. But distance it, you would have expected the mission to say, distance it, distance it from the bore of your neighbor, from distance it from your neighbor's pit, three tvachim, or sabasi, which we'll talk about in a minute. But instead of saying distance it from your friend's bore, it says distance it from your friend's wall. That's weird. We weren't talking about a wall. We were talking about, we didn't say don't do it from the boundary of your friend. We said don't do it from the bore of your friend. So we're going to have to deal with this. It's the biggest question the, Mishnah ha- the Gemara has on the Mishnah. And then it says, visabasid. And you have to put, like I said, sealing, right? You have to seal it with limestone so that it doesn't, right? The water damage doesn't get there. Now, there's a debate about whether this is either distance it or do sabbasid or maybe it means both okay we're going to see that later other things that you have to distance from your friend's board um, or from their wall okay it actually says mikotlo okay here you have to do it from their wall not from their board you have to distance the gefet the zevel et hamelach et hasid et haslaim mikotlo shal chavero shloshat vachim so the gefet is the the dregs the like the what's left in after you make olive oil from the olives. If you might remember, we had it in Masechet Shabbat when we were talking about cooking, it creates heat, okay? It's a, it's a source of heat and zevel, the fertilizer, also perhaps the issue is it creates heat and the heat can also ruin the wall of your neighbor, it can wear away at it. Melach, the salt, that's more of a chemical reaction, or the seed, the limestone, or the slaim, or stones, it's unclear exactly what we mean. It could be flint, it could be we're not sure. Okay, there's different opinions. It could be just having rocks there. People will kick the rocks and it'll ruin the wall. It'll get in the way. It's unclear exactly what the issue of the stones are. So again, you have to distance it from your neighbor's wall, either, right, three tvachim, or make sure to do sabbasit. Here it says, oh, although some versions have ve, okay, just like the first part. You have to, seeds have to be distanced. Okay, and the plow, because the plow breaks up the land and then it could kind of loosen up the, the foundation of the wall. Okay, there's ra'im also, I guess the, the seeds could also, you know, it weakens, when there's seeds there, it weakens the, takes away from the, the soil, right? It weakens the ground there, which could ruin their wall. And also the machresha could also mean if you're getting there, then you're walking right near the wall, you could be damaging somehow. Vet me raglaim. Okay, urine, minakota, you have to distance that either for smell purposes or also maybe chemical, chemically it's not good. Okay, here you have to get into the reality of the, the, the utensils they used. We're talking about a millstone with a big stone with a small stone on top. So the big stone juts out farther. So it's going to have to be three from the bottom of the big millstone, which is going to be four tvachim from the top piece, which is narrower. And the same thing with the oven. It's a bit of a debate about which part is what. There's a rim, which is narrower, obviously. So it's going to be four from the rim. And from the wider part of the oven, there's just a debate whether the rim is at the top or the rim is at the bottom on like a stand that the oven is on. Okay, either which way it has to be, three from the part that's, you know, juts out and four from the part that's, let you know that's more in uh, here again the tanur is the heat what's the problem with the rechaim the millstone well the the vibrations it it cuts all the right it, it crushes up the grains and it works very fast and with loud vibrations and that the vibrations could affect the wall nearby okay so now that's our mission the gemara starts off with our big question which is patach bebor basim bekotel turning out on a bet and there's a study guide for the the second part of what we're going to get to after we get through the first part here, we're going to get there's a study guide with charts that will help you understand the continuation or keep it organized. So it started with bore and then ended with a, a wall. So now it's a little confusing. It said distance it from your friend's pit, right? Don't put, don't dig it near your friend's pit. Distance it from their wall. It's a little bit strange to have said distance it from the pit, right? And that's what's in parentheses, which 
whether you read or not read, that's what it means. Should have said, unless you distance it from your friend's pit, not from their wall. So Amar Abai, the Itamar of Yehuda, Mikotel Boro Shanin. We don't mean wall, the boundary. We mean the wall of the person's pit. Okay? We mean if the person has a pit right near the border, make sure to distance it from the wall of their pit, three tvachim. To which the Gemara says, the litany, elaim kenu chikmi borosho chabero. Okay, what they're, let, let's explain already here with me. Look at Rashi. Okay, this is very complicated to understand this next section. I'm going to go with Rashi's interpretation. Just know there's other interpretations. Rashi says here, Velini mi borosho chabero. If you just said boro, oh, sorry, I'm already on the question. Sorry, I meant to say the earlier Rashi. Mi kota borosho ninu. Klamar. Hi, Kotel de Katane, the Kota. Okay, this actually Rashi doesn't add much yet. What we mean is distance it if there's a boar right near the border. Don't distance it from the boar, three Tvachim. Distance it from the wall of the boar. By the way, what is a wall of a boar? So, a wall of a boar could be two things. A boar, basically, you just dig. What's the wall? So, the wall could be, well, depending on what kind of ground you have and how you can do this, you might have to put stones in and build a wall to then kind of have a, a pit there so all the dirt doesn't fall into your, your pit. Um, that's one option. It's, it's an actual physical wall of your bore. But another option, and more likely, or at least there are cases of this, it's just the ground around. And what we're saying is the ground that's around your bore basically functions as a wall to your bore to prevent, right? Okay, that, that basically supports your bore, right? A bore is just a hole, but it's not just the hole. It's the fact that you have you have soil around it, and that all the soil in the area around, and this is what we're going to learn soon, how thick, but the soil, that actually functions as your wall. So now the Gemara says, before we understand this a little better, let's just see the Gemara's question, although it's hard to understand the question a little bit. So why don't they just say, distance it from the bore of your friend, three tvachim. Okay, now Rashi says, Va'ana yadana de mikotel kamer. I would obviously know it means from the wall of your bore. Why is that? What we're basically going to say, what there's an assumption here is that when the friend built the bore, okay, what, what happened here is I came, I wanted to dig a, a pit. My neighbor already has one right near the border. But the assumption here, when we say mikotel baro, we're talking about the kotel of the boar, the assumption is that the neighbor, again, this is Rashi's explanation, the neighbor already had to have distanced his boar from the wall, three tvachim. Why? Because the boar includes the wall, right? And that all has to be in his domain and can't be going into my domain. So basically, they already distanced it three tvachim. And therefore it's saying, right, the Gemara then questions, well, if that's all considered part of the bore, then it still could have said below, to which, right? In other words, if the bore kind of includes the wall, then obviously we're saying, right, the bore, the wall, it's all one and the same. So why did the Gemara have to use the word kotel? Well, haka mashman, it must be coming to teach you a different halacha, okay? De kotel bor shloshat vachim. Okay, it wants you to know that what's the size of the wall of a boar? Three tvachim. How do we know this from our Mishnah? Okay, this was a little complicated. But the way they're understanding it is like this. The first person to dig a boar had to leave a wall of three tvachim. Okay, because that's, okay, they need to, that, that their boar includes the wall and they have to distance the three tvachim. And what our Mishnah is telling us is when I go to dig my boar, I can't put it right next to the wall. I also have to distance it three tfachim from their wall, from the end of their bore, basically, which includes their wall, which ends up, again, this is Rashi's interpretation, you have six tfachim, okay? So what they want you to know is, okay, and I'm going to read how I know that Rashi says this, because in the Ha Kamash, what it's really coming to teach you is some other halacha, which is a boar's wall is three tfachim, which is needed for what? The Gemara says, Nefkamina lemekachumem. Let me just read that until the end, and then I'll read Rashi. 
What you need to know this for is for selling and buying, okay? In what way? This is just like the Kad and Chavid in Aminiach et Kad, where there you put down a Kad and then all of a sudden the Mishnah starts talking about the owner of the Chavid. Well, weren't we just talking about a Kad, a jug, not a barrel? Why do we interchange them? And we learn to say, well, some places interchange those. If you sell a Chavit, you can actually give the guy a boar, uh, a Kad, because you could say, oh, well, I thought when I said Chavit, I was selling you a Chavit. I thought I meant... I was, I was intending cod. So here, they want to teach you some other thing from Mecca Chumemkar, which is Kedetanya. I'm selling you a boar in its walls. If I promised you I was selling you a boar and the walls around it, how much is considered the walls around it? And this, by the way, makes a lot of sense. If we say it wasn't a physical wall, it's just the surrounding area that functions as a wall our mission teaches us it's three tvachim. Now, how does the mission teach us this? And again, Ash is going to now really explain better what this whole section really came to say, which is ha kamash malan. I mean, Rashi on the words that start ha kamash malan. B'may ditnan mi kotel baro lamad nuba. The fact that they use the word kotel baro, this is all to teach us. Sha kotel baro shalishon milei kosh l'shat tvachim shuz kak gamhu la'archik menamitzah. The key thing it's really teaching you again is that the person who built the first bore, which is not the one we're discussing in the Mishnah, we're talking about neighbor comes along and says, oh, I want to dig a bore, but my neighbor already has one. Well, it's teaching you already that you have to distance the three tfachim from the wall of your neighbor's bore, which means that the wall of your neighbor's bore, we're assuming, already was distanced three tfachim from the border. In other words, your neighbor already distanced his three tfachim from the border, and you have to distance yours three tfachim on the other direction. Okay. And um, and from that, we're going to learn this extra thing, which is the wall of a boar, if you're doing business dealings, is three tefachim wide. Now, this is going to assume one thing, which is going to create problems for us going forward, which is that even though our Mishnah said, don't dig a boar in the proximity, a certain proximity to your neighbor's boar, it sounds like what? If there wasn't a boar there, I could put it right up against the border. Now, the way we just explained the mission, it sounds like, well, the first guy also needed to distance it from the border, even though the neighbor didn't have a board at all. So keep this in mind as we go forward, because that's going to be a big question to some of these interpretations we're going to see. So now we get to this big machloket, and for that, there's a chart on the page. Itmar. If I want to put a board right next to the border, am I allowed to? So, and this is why you're going to see that this is going to come in conflict with our Mishnah and the way we understood the Mishnah. Abai amar somech, Rav amar eno somech. So we have a machlok at Abai and Rava, whether I can put it right up against the border or I can't. So now, the assumption here is you don't have anything on your side. And I want to put my boar, again, the Mishnah seems to imply only if there was already a boar on the other side. However, once we explain the Mishnah, it seems to imply... Even the first person, before there was another boar, has to distance it three tvachim. So it's confusing. So Abai says, no problem. You can put it right up against the board. Rava says, no, you can't. So now the question is, in what kind of field are we discussing? Now, there's two kinds of fields. There's fields that can kind of function with rainwater or have, let's say, a channel of water running through or a river or something like that. There's other fields that you need to dig borot, ditches, because you need to have water there to be able to water your fields. So there's Sedeha Asuyala Barot, which is kind of, you're going to need to, at some point, you're going to dig a, a bore. And then we have ones that are not, because you don't really need it. So, Bisadeha Asuyala Barot, Divrea Kolino Somech. Now, this machloket is obviously not, now this is the first version. Okay, we'll say obviously not, but according to this reading. If you have a Sedeh, which if I want to dig a bore next to a field where there's no borot, but it's a field that is going to need borot dug there, well, then everyone agrees I can't put it right up against the wall because I'm preventing you from digging in your area. There must be in a field that isn't necessarily going to need borot or, or isn't likely going to need borot. And therefore, Abai says, Somech, you can put it right up against, because the assumption is your boar is damaging their boar, not anything else. So if they're not going to anyway dig a boar, of course you can put it right up against the wall. Rava Amari no Somech. Rava says, no way. 
They could say, listen, you decided to dig a bore here. The second guy could say, hey, don't dig a bore right next to my wall because you just decided to dig a bore. Maybe later I'll decide I want a bore for some other reason. So that's the debate between Abai and Rava, according to the first version. Ikeda Amri, but some people say, and now we're going to just shift everything. Everyone's going to agree that if the field is not meant for Borot, of course you could put your bore right next to the wall because the person's not going to dig a well. We don't have to worry about the off chance that maybe they'll decide to change their mind and do that. Ki Puligi, the Machloket is in the other case. Now, this goes back to how much do I have to be concerned about what I'm doing and how it's going to affect you down the road. So, even if you have a field that's meant for Barot, you don't have a bore there right now, Abai says, Sumech, I can put it there. And even, now, remember I told you about Machlok at Rabbanan and Rabbi Yossi, even Afilu Rabbanan da Amre, Marchi Kimet HaElam and Abor, Esrim V'chamesh Ama, even according to the rabbis who hold, that if you have a bore, I can't put my tree 25 cubits away because eventually the roots will get there and ruin your bore. That's not the same as here because hatamhu de bi idana de kanata I have to worry about future potential damage that I'm going to cause you because right now when I want to plant my tree, your bore is in existence. Avalhacha, but here bi idana de kachafa le talabor. But right now you don't have anything there. Why do I have to worry about maybe you'll want to dig a bore there? It's not my problem. Even the rabbis who think in general I have to be concerned, it's only if you actually have a bore there now. If your bore is in existence, I don't have to worry about the future possibility. Maybe you'll want to dig a bore there. Okay? Even in a place that's asuyala borot, but you know, you have other places in your field you could put the bore. It's not my problem. The rava, he's going to say the opposite. A no somech. You can't put it near because it's in a sede asuyala borot. And a filu the Rabbi Yossi, and even Rabbi Yossi who has this attitude of do whatever that you want, da'amar zechofer betoch shalo v'zenotea betoch shalo. In the tree case, he says, you can dig your bore and the other one can plant their tree and, you know, don't, each one doesn't have to worry. Well, that's hanemile hatam to be done de kanata late nehu l'shavashim demaz kilalabor. But that's because when I plant my tree, if your bore is in existence, I don't have to worry about it, according to Rabbi Yossi, because it's going to take a long time for my roots to get to you. That's what we call indirect damages. Eventually, it'll get the 25 cubits to your space, you know, or 24, let's say it's less than 25. But I don't have to worry about that. But when I dig my bore right next to your, right, your, your potential space to dig a bore, I'm ruining your land right now. Because every blow I do into the ground when I'm digging is going to damage your prop, your land ne- nearby. And that land will no longer be land that will be strong enough to hold a bore in it. And that's why even Rabbi Yossi will agree because that's called direct damages. So we now had all these different approaches to which case do they have a machloket and what's their opinion. Now we're going to bring three difficulties. Okay, we're going to have a difficulty on Rava according to the first reading. We're going to have a difficulty, two difficulties on Abai according to the second reading. And with that, we'll finish today's daf. So it's not. The first two are going to be from our Mishnah. So our Mishnah says, Lo yechfor adam bor samuch lebor shel chavero. Ta'am adi ikabor, hale kabor samech. Again, the whole Mishnah implies that I can't dig a bore if your bore is there. But if you don't have a bore there, it sounds like I could put it right up against the wall. So, now, the question is, which case is it? Sedes yu alabor, lo as yu alabor. Now, the easy way to understand this in the most simplest way is that if we say if we go by the second language now in the second set the second part okay and if you look at this chart you'll see it bolded rava holds there's a case where eno somech right and abai holds in both cases you can be somech whether it's asuyalabor and asuyalabor you can put it nearby right and rava holds there's one case where you can't be somech now, if you say, now this Mishnah implies you can be Somech. Now, everybody in this Lashon, this reading, has a case where you can be Somech because everyone agrees that if the Sadez is, is not meant for Borot, of course you could put it right next to the border. Even Rabbi agrees with that. So when our Mishnah implies that you could put it right next to the border if there's nothing there, we could just say very simply, Matnitim Besadeh She'ena Suya The Mishnah is talking about a case where you're not going to 
it's not meant for borot, and therefore, yes, you could put it right up against, as long, right, if there's nothing there, of course you could put it right up against, you don't have to worry on the off chance, maybe they'll dig a bore, and the only problem is when there's a bore in existence. But, for the first Lashon, we're going to have a problem according to Rava, because according to Rava, let's just look at the first Lashon, everyone agrees in the case of it's borot, you can't put any, you can't put a bore right next to there. And Rava says, even if it's not a suyala borot, you can't put a bore. So according to Rava, you can never put a bore next to your neighbor's property, even if they don't have a bore there. And the Mishnah seemed to imply you could. So that's going to be the contradiction. Abaye, of course, says, in any case, you could put it nearby, as long as the sade is not meant for borot. So according to Abaye, you would just say the Mishnah is talking about a case they say nasu yala borot, and therefore, if the boar is there, you can't do it. If it's not there, you can, and that's a baya, that's perfect. But Laravo says, no way, no how, you can't ever, kasha, the mission makes no sense. But remember how he explained the Mishnah. Even though the simple reading of the Mishnah seems to imply only if the other one has a boar, but if there's no boar, you don't have to distance it at all, but wait. Didn't we explain the Mishnah? But Amar Lecharava Ha'it Marla. What do you mean? We explained the Mishnah saying Amar Abaye Bitemar of Yehuda Mikotel Baro Shaninu. The whole thing is from the wall of the boar, and that's why it used that language. Meaning, even the first person. What did we say? The first person who builds when there's nothing on the other side already from the beginning needs to distance their boar three tefachim. So therefore, of course, the Mishnah means that, and of course, Rava fits perfectly with the Mishnah. Because the mission implies you do have to distance yourself, at least the three tvachim, from the wall of your neighbor. You can't dig, even if there's nothing on the other side. And then that fits perfectly with Rava. So now we're going to bring the second version of the, the same difficulty, which is going to be obviously, well then, this reading, the, the Mishnah plus the Gemara on it, is going to raise a question for Abaye in the second reading. Because there, he's going to say, you can put it next to the wall, and we just learned that you always have to distance it, even if nobody else has anything on the other side. So let's read it inside. Some people say that they started with already the Gemara's explanation of the Mishnah, which was, which assumed anyone who digs a bore always has to distance it from the neighbor's property, even if right there's nothing on the other side. So, again, we'll see the first Lashon here works perfectly because Then you would just say If you say everyone agrees, the second version, that if it's meant for Barot, then you, you're allowed to put it there. Then we would say, I'm sorry, sorry, If it's meant for Barot, you can put it. That's the first version. Then the Mishnah is B'sadeh HaSuyah Borot, And therefore, Abai and Rabbi both agree in that case you can't put it near. And that is exactly what we learned about our Mishnah. Again, it's not what the Mishnah says. It's what we explained the Mishnah as saying that the first person already needs to distance. And that's because it must be talking about a field that's meant for Borot. And therefore, everyone agrees. But if you say, L'haf Lishana, the second Lashon, D'amar B'sadeh HaSuyah Borot Pligi. Even if it's meant for Borot, Abai says you can put it next to the wall. Then Abai thinks in every case you could put it next to the wall, according to that version. And then you're going to have a problem. Bishlam ala Rava nicha, because Rava will say, oh, it's just a sadasu yala barot. There you can't put it near. But Abaye has no way to say you can ever, there's ever a problem to put it near. He thinks in all cases you could put it right up against the wall, as long as there's no bore on the other side. So Amar lecha Abaye, matnitin shabau lachvor bevatachat. He would have to explain our Mishnah to resolve this problem, if you go by that language as a case where both of us started digging at the same time. It's not that you had a bore already, but we were both digging at the same time. Then I have a problem, okay? If you don't have anything there, then I could put it next to it. But our Mishnah, which says, we both have to distance three Tvachim, is because, right, that I have to distance the three Tvachim from yours, which is already distanced three Tvachim. We're actually talking about where we're both digging at the same time. Last question, Tashma. And this is a totally different source. Sela Habab Yadayim, and it's going to be the same question as we just had on Abaya in the second language, who thinks that, again, you can always put it next to it, the wall. Sela Habab Yadayim, if there's soft soil, okay, the soil is very soft and easily breakable. Zechofer Baro Mikan, Vezechofer Baro Mikan. Zemrachik Shloshat Vachim Vesabasi, Vezemrachik Shloshat Vachim Vesabasi. You can dig yours, I can dig mine, but we each have to distance the three Tvachim. Now, what do you see here? According to Abaye, you can put it up against the wall, no matter what. 
Here it says you can't. You have to distance it three tefachim. So the Gemara says, oh, this is a different case. This isn't a difficulty because babi yadayim shani. It's because the ground is so tender and, and easily ruined that that's why you have to distance yourself. So the Gemara says, that's such an obvious answer. How did they even think that this was a question? Ude karela, my karela. What were they thinking in the beginning? Well, they thought that this really applies to all borot, but why did they specifically mention the case of babi yadayim? Babi Yadayim eats Trichale, they needed to because Sakadat Tachamina Kebante Babi Yadayim, you might have thought, regular board, you need to distance three Tvachim. But maybe Babi Yadayim, Libai Nami Rav maybe you need more space to distance. Maybe three Tvachim isn't enough. Kamash Malan that no. Babi Yadayim needs the same as everything else, you need to distance three Tvachim. But anyway, it's not a problem because it assumes it's like everything else, and in all other cases, you have to distance. Which would then, um, one second, right, no. So then, that's what we originally thought, and that's why we thought it was a question on Abai. But in the end, we say, no, it's really just unique to Babi Adayim, and it's not for any other case. Any other case, Abai would say, you could put it right up against the wall, and that's how Abai would understand the source. Okay, so what did we do in the second part of today's stuff after getting through all the Bako Miko Kol and Drashot on that? Basically talked about how much one needs to distance a bore from the friend's bore or other things from the friend's wall that might cause damage, ways you can prevent damages. From there, we got to the language in the mission. Something was off because it talked about a bore and then all of a sudden a wall. And that taught us basically that even the first person who comes has to already distance their wall, even if there's nothing on the other side for three tefachim. And then you also have to distance yours three tefachim. You can't say, oh, well, his is already three tefachim. I could just put mine up against the wall. No. Both sides have to distance three tefachim. Then we brought this big machlok up to an Abai and Rava, two different versions of exactly what case. And then we had to try to raise, we raised questions from our Mishnah or from our Mishnah with the Gemara's explanation, you know, and then we had to figure out how can we, res, you know, resolve those difficulties and the last one as well. So three difficulties against different opinions and different, you know, depending on the first language or the second language of understanding the machlok, but we resolved all our issues. With that, we finish for today. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom and Shinshma B'Sorot Tovot.